So with that, I conclude my third section. Now I have a fourth brief uh, section to conclude, in which I want to speak about the modern subject and Husserl's relation to the modern subject. And there's a subtitle, Modern Subject, Political and Epistemological. Political and Epistemological. There are some problems in Husserl's argumentation, some things we wish, might have wished that he had done differently, and we all have our own favorite examples. To my mind, some of the most questionable relate to his extreme focus on the solitary subject. I think, for instance, that his reduction to the Eigenheitssphere, the sphere of ownness, is problematic. He seems to assume that we could still have categorical intentionality within that domain, but how could that be possible? How can we imagine ourselves even predicating things if other minds are not part of uh, what we are examining? I also think the Cartesian way to reduction is a misleading uh, way of escorting the re reader into the phenomenological attitude, and of course Husserl himself later in his career acknowledged as such. The isolation of the single ego in, his, in this argument, as well as the apparent disqualification of the world as given to us, distract the reader from what, what is really important in this procedure, <coughs> namely the shift of focus from things to the correlation between things and the datives to whom they are given. What is important is the transcendental turn, or the turn into first philosophy, not the arguments that lead into it, and especially not the Cartesian arguments. Now, such problems in Husserl's thought are made more understandable and perhaps more excusable if we consider the way that modern philosophy as a whole has centered on the subject. An essential element in the philosophy of the last 500 years has been a radical turn to the subject. In fact, it would be better to call it a construction of the subject, not the turn toward it. And it has been the construction of the subject in two different forms in modernity, the political subject and the epistemological subject. The political subject was first invented by Machiavelli, who calls it the prince, and it was theoretically articulated by Thomas Hobbes, who calls it the sovereign. The political subject is the modern state as opposed to the ancient polis. The political subject is not something we find, but something we construct by philosophical thinking. The epistemological subject, of course, is the Cartesian cogito. Modern thinking is not the establishment of just one of these subjects, but of the subject in these two forms, which must be distinguished but never separated from one another. To use the words of another American philosopher, uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Francis Slade, both the political subject and the epistemological subject, quote, are inventions of thought, ideal constructions effected by thought, unquote. Concerning the political subject, Slade says, quote, the state is not visible to the eyes. It does not exist outside of thought, and therefore it does not exist until it is thought. But being thought, and being a thought, it possesses brilliant clarity, an idea that can be conceived very clearly and distinctly." End quote. And then in another passage, as Slate says, quote, the sovereign is a thought, only in thought can something like a sovereign make an appearance and be seen, sovereign in Hobbes' sense, end quote. These attributes of the political subject also belong to the epistemological subject. The cogito is not visible to the eyes, and it does not exist outside of thinking or until it is thought. Once thought, it possesses brilliant clarity and distinctness, and only in thinking can something like the cogito make an appearance. The political subject is the expression of what Slate calls decontextualized rule, a pattern of ruling that needs no context, no reference to any context, decontextualized rule. And the epistemological subject is the expression of 
disembodied thinking or the disembodied intellect. In both cases, we find ourselves not discovering things, but inventing them in sheer freedom and autonomy. It's important to keep in mind both these forms of the subject, the political and the epistemological. The epistemological taken just by itself might seem to be a little more than an absurd conundrum that interests nobody but philosophers. But if it's taken as the Gegenstück, the counterpart, to the political subject, its ominous significance for our cultural and political life becomes much more visible. This modern sense of the subject was the background for Husserl's thought. If Husserl was to turn to first philosophy, he had to do so within the setting given him by his day and age. He had to think through the turn to the subject. He has nothing directly to say about the political subject, but he does have a lot to say about the epistemological subject. His philosophy is, I claim, an attempt to embody and mundanize the cogito, to put mind back into the world, to introduce receptivity and corporeality, as well as absence and obscurity, all of which serve to change the Cartesian cogito, the disembodied intellect, into someone who says I and speaks with others in human conversation about things. Husserl's transcendental ego is someone who is visible in the natural and public order and not just in thought. I think this is brought out because when he first starts defining things and, and making points about intentionality, he makes those distinctions in regard to the use of words, but the distinction between expressions and indications. And that's not a constructed Cartesian ego. It's a user of language. Husserl gives us resources by which we can unthink modern philosophy insofar as it rejects classical philosophy. What he does with the epistemological subject can have an impact on the political subject as well. To conclude, I wish to call to mind Husserl's honesty and generosity as a thinker. His writings bear witness to his relentless effort to clarify the issues he addresses. It's not just his ideas that come through in his writing, his personality comes through in them as well. He was willing to correct what he had said before, ready to subject any and all of his positions to new scrutiny. He wanted most of all to get it right and to let things speak for themselves. He's influenced philosophy for over a hundred years. There have been very prominent beneficiaries of his thought, Heidegger, Gadamer, Edith Stein, Levinas, Merleau-Ponty, Sartre. And there are countless scholars and philosophers like ourselves who have been very deeply shaped by his writings. Intellectual achievement is a highly personal thing. And we need to be grateful to those who have shared their gifts with us. But if Husserl's thinking was to exercise such an influence on others, it had to find its place in the Lebensfeld. There needed to be something tangible that would serve as the vehicle for his thought. His greatest impact has always been through his writings, even from the beginning of his career with the philosophy of arithmetic and the debate with Frege and his logical investigations. And as it turned out historically, after Husserl's death, the material embodiment of his thought found its place in the world in and through the Husserl archives. We can hardly remember Husserl without thinking of the archives dedicated to him. For this reason, let us take a moment during this commemoration of Husserl to mention the person and work of Father Hermann Leo van Breda, OFM, and to recall what he did to keep Husserl's philosophy present as a resource for all of us. I recall a conference many years ago during which Walter Beemel spoke about Van Breda shortly after Van Breda died in 1974. Beemel, and I remember him saying this uh, in an agitated way, he said, Beemel extolled what he called Van Breda's ungeheure energie. I can still see him, uh, I can recollect it, uh, saying that with... Uh, uh, Panache. 
Energetic Van Breda was, and he was also courageous and astute. He saved Husserl's manuscripts, institutionalized the Husserl archives here at Leuven, found financial support for the archives and their publications. He was generous in sharing the archives with other universities. He knew that in intellectual matters, to give something away is to enrich oneself. Van Breda understood the importance of Husserl's work, and his understanding was not only theoretic, it had a wonderfully practical side. Our conference commemorates the life and work of Edmund Husserl, but by its very location, it, recall, it also recalls the qualities of Hermann Leo Van Breda, as well as those who have succeeded him in the leadership of the archives, Samuel Eiseling, Rudolf Bernet, and Ulrich Mella, who have faithfully continued the work of this center in the spirit of both Husserl and Van Breda. All of, these achievement, all of these achievements and all of these people have left us a rich legacy of philosophical life. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.